chapter 98. Old Hugh Ald soon replaced Augustus as the main talker in the Hat Creek outfit. He caught up with the herd with his wagon load of coats and supplies near the Missouri, which they crossed near Fort Benton. The soldiers at the tiny outpost were as surprised to see the cowboys as if they were men from another planet. The commander, a lanky major named Court, could scarcely believe his eyes when he looked up and saw the herd spread out over the plain. When told that most of the cattle had been gathered below the Mexican border, he was astonished, but not too astonished to buy 200 head. Buffalo were scarce and the fort not well provisioned. Call was short with Major Court. He had been short with everyone since Gus's death. Everyone wondered when he would stop going north, but no one dared ask. There had been several light snows, and when they crossed the Missouri, it was so cold that the men built a huge fire on the north bank to warm up. Jasper Fant came near to realizing his lifelong fear of drowning when his horse spooked at a beaver and shook him off into the icy water. Fortunately, Ben Rainey caught him and pulled him ashore. Jasper was blue with cold, even though they covered him with blankets and got him to the fire. It was a while before he could be convinced that he was alive. Why, you could have waited out, old Hugh said, astonished that a man would be frightened over such little thing as a soaking. If you think that's water, you think it's cold now, try setting a few beaver traps around February, he added, thinking it would help the man put things in perspective. Jester couldn't speak for an hour. Most of the men had long since grown bored with his drowning fears, and they left him to dry out his clothes as best he could. That night, when he was warm enough to be bitter, Jasper vowed to spend the rest of his life north of the Missouri rather than cross such a stream again. Also, he developed an immediate resentment against beavers and angered old Hugh Auld several times on the trip north by firing at them recklessly with his pistol if he saw some in a pond. Them's beaver, old Hugh kept saying. You trap beaver, you don't shoot them. A bullet will ruin the pelt. The pelt's the whole point. Well, I hate little toothy sons of bitches, Jasper said. The pelts be damned. Call kept riding northwest until even old Hugh began to be worried. The great line of the Rockies was clear to the west. The old Hugh was the scout. It was Call who rode on ahead. Once in a while, old Hugh might point out a landmark, but he was shy about offering advice. Call made it clear that he didn't want advice. Though accustomed to his silences, none of the men could remember him being that silent. For days, he didn't utter a word. He merely came in and got his food and left again. Several of the men became convinced that he didn't mean to stop, that he would lead them north into the snows and they would all freeze. The day after they crossed the Marius, old dog disappeared. From being a lead steer, he had drifted back to the drags and usually trailed a mile or two behind the herd. Always he was there in the morning, but one morning he wasn't. Newton the Rainey, still in charge of the drags, went back to look for him and saw two grizzlies making a meal of the old steer. At the sight of the bears, their horses bolted and raced back to the herd. Their fear instantly communicated itself to all animals, and the herd and Remuda stampeded. Several cowboys got thrown, including Newt, but no one was hurt, though it took an afternoon to gather the scattered herd. A few days later, they finally came to the Milk River. It was a crisp fall day, and most of the men were wearing their new coats. The slopes of the mountains to the west were covered with snow. That's the last one, old Hugh said. You go much north of that river and you're in Canada. Call left the herd to graze and rode east alone for a day. The country was beautiful, with plenty of grass and timber enough in the creek bottoms for building a house and corrals. He came across scattered buffalo, including one large herd. He saw plentiful Indian sign, but no Indians. It was cold, but brilliantly sunny. He felt that the whole top of the Montana Territory was empty except for the buffalo, the Indians, and the Hat Creek outfit. He knew it was time to stop and get a house of some kind built before a blizzard caught them. He knew one could come at any time. He himself paid no attention to weather and didn't care, but there were men to think of. It was too late for most of them to go back to Texas that fall. Like it or not, they were going to be wintering in Montana. That night, camping alone, he dreamed of Gus. Frequently, he woke up to hear Gus's voice, so real he looked around expecting to see him. Sometimes he would scarcely fall asleep before he dreamed of Gus, and it was even beginning to happen in the daytime if he rode alone not paying attention to his surroundings. 
Gus dead invaded his thoughts as readily as he had when he was alive. Usually he came to Josh and tease much like he had in his life. Just because you've got the top of the country, you don't have to stop, he said in one dream. Turn east and keep going till you hit Chicago. Call didn't want to turn east, but neither did he particularly want to stop. Gus's death and the ones before it had caused him to lose his sense of purpose to such an extent that he scarcely cared for one day to the next what he was doing. He kept on going north because it had become a habit. But they had reached the Milk River, and winter was coming, so he had to break the habit, else lose most of the men and probably the cattle too. He found a creek with a good stand of shelter and timber and decided it would do for headquarters, but he felt no eagerness for the tasks ahead. Work, the one thing that had always belonged to him, no longer seemed to matter. He did it because there was nothing else to do, not because he felt the need. Some days he felt so little interest in the herd and the men that he could simply have ridden off and left them to make the best of things. The old sense of being responsible for being their well-being had left him so completely that he often wondered how he could ever felt it so strongly. The way they looked at him in the morning as they waited for orders irritated him more and more. Why should grown men wait for orders every day after coming 3,000 miles? Frequently he gave no orders, merely ate his breakfast and rode off, leaving them with puzzled expressions on their faces. An hour later when he looked back he would see that they were following and that too irritated him. Sometimes he felt he would prefer to look back and see the plains empty, all the followers and cattle banished. But nothing like that happened, and when he had settled on a headquarters, he told the men to drive the cattle east for a day and then let them graze at will. The drive was over. The ranch would lie between the milk and the Missouri. He would file on the land in the spring. What about them of us that want to go back to Texas, Dishbog had asked. Call was surprised. Until then, no one had suggested going back to Texas. It's late in the year, he said. You'd better be advised to wait and go in the spring. Dish looked at him stubbornly. I didn't hire on for no winter in Montana, he said. I guess if I could have my wages, I'd take my chances. Well, you're needed for the building, Call said, reluctant to lose him. Dish looked as if he stood ready to ride south then and there. Once that's done, any can go that wants, Call added. Dishboggett felt angry. He hadn't hired on to Carpenter either. His first work for the Hat Creek outfit had been well digging, and his last would be swinging an axe, it all appeared. Neither was work fit for a cow hand, and he was on the verge of demanding his wages and standing up for his rights as a free man. But the captain's look dissuaded him, and the next morning when they started the herd east along the milk, he took the point for the last time. With Old Dog dead, the Texas Bull was frequently in the forefront of the drive. He looked ugly, for his wound had been sewed up unevenly, and being one-eyed and one-horned made him look even more irascible. He'd often turn and attack anyone who approached him on his blind side. Several men had narrowly escaped disaster, and only the fact that Captain Call favored the Bull had kept them from shooting him. Dish resolved that as soon as the building was done, he would go like a streak for Nebraska. The thought that a stranger might come along and win Lori before he could get back was a torment to him, but it made him one of the more vigorous members of the logging crew once the building got started. Most of the other members of the crew, Jasper and Needle particularly, were less vigorous, and they irritated Dish by taking frequent breaks, leaving him to chop alone. They'd sit around smoking, keeping a close watch for bears, while Dish flailed away, the sound of the striking axe echoing far across the valley of the Milk River. Before the work had been in progress a week, an event occurred which changed the men's attitude dramatically. The event was a blizzard, which howled out of the north for three days. Only the fact that Call had seen to it that ample firewood had been cut saved the outfit. The men had never known or imagined such cold. They built two large fires and huddled between them, feeding them logs, freezing on the side not closest to the fire. The first day there was no visibility at all. The men could not even go to the horses without the risk of being lost in the swirling snow. It's worse than a sandstorm, Needle said. Yeah, and colder too, Jasper said. I've got my feet practically in the fire my darn toes are still frozen. Dish found to his annoyance that his own breath caused his mustache to freeze, something he would not have imagined could happen. The men put on all the clothes they had and were still terribly cold. 
When the storm blew out and the sun reappeared, the cold refused to leave. In fact, it got colder, formed such a hard crust on the snow that the men slipped and fell just going a few feet to the wagon. Only Poe Campo seemed to thrive in the weather. He still relied largely on his serape, plus an old scarf he had found somewhere, and he annoyed the men by nagging them to go shoot a bear. His theory was that bear meat would help them get used to the weather. Even if it didn't, a bear skin might come in handy. Yeah, and them darn bears probably think a little man meat would come in handy, Soupy observed. P.I., the tallest man in the group, had developed a new fear, which was that he would be swallowed up in a snowdrift. He had always worried about quicksand, and now he was in a place where all he could see for miles around was a colder version of quicksand. If it was to cover you up, I reckon you'd freeze, he said over and over until the men were tired of hearing it. Most of the men were tired of hearing one another saying anything. The complaints characteristic of each had come to bore them thoroughly as a group. Newt found that he had no urge either to talk or listen. But he did have an urge to stay warm, and he spent as much of the day by the fire as he honorably could. The only parts of his body that he was still conscious of were his hands, feet, and ears, all of which were dreadfully cold. When the storm abated, they rode out to check the cattle. He tied an old flannel shirt over his ears, and they still felt frozen. The livestock weathered the storm fairly well, although some of the cattle had drifted far south and had to be pushed back toward the milk. Even so, within ten days of the blizzard, a sizable rough log house had been built, complete with a fireplace and chimney, both the work of Poe Campo. He took advantage of a few days' thaw to make great quantity of mud bricks, all of which froze hard with the next freeze. The roof had hardly been on the cabin a day when the next blizzard hit. This time, though, the men were comparatively warm. To their amazement, Captain Call refused to live in the house. He set up the old tent of wheelbargers in a sheltered spot on the creek and spent his nights in it, sometimes building a small fire in front of it. Every morning the men expected to come out and find him frozen. Instead, he came in every morning and found them sleeping too late, reluctant to leave their blankets for the chill. But there were still corrals to build and a smokehouse and improvements on the cabin. Call saw that the men stayed at work while he himself did most of the checking on the livestock, sometimes taking Newt with him on his rounds. He killed several buffalo and taught Newt how to quarter them. Old Hugh Ald came and went at will on his spotty pony. Though he talked constantly while he was with the crew, he often developed what he called lonesome feelings and disappeared for ten days at a time. Once in a prolonged warm spell, he came racing in excitedly and informed Call that there was a herd of wild horses grazing only 20 miles to the south. Since the Hat Creek Remuda was not in the best of shape, Call decided to go see about the horses. They had a great stroke of luck and caught them in a box canyon only 15 miles from the headquarters. The horses were smallish, but still fat from summer's grazing. Bert Borum, the best roper in the outfit, caught 18 of the horses and they were brought back hobbled to the Remuda. True to his word, Dish Boggett drew his wages and left the day after they caught the wild horses. Call it assumed the blizzards would have taught the young man the folly of leaving and was annoyed when Dish asked for his pay. There's no time to be traveling in country, you don't know, Call said. I pointed that herd the whole way up here, Dish said stubbornly. I guess I can find my way back. Besides, I got a coat. Call had little money on him, but he had arranged for credit in the little bank of Miles City and wrote Dish out an order for his wages using the bottom of a frying pan to rest his tablet on. It was just after breakfast and a number of the hands were watching. There had been a light snowfall the night before and the plains were white for miles around. Dern, we might as well hold a funeral right now, Soupy said. He won't even make it to the Yellowstone, much less Nebraska. It's that whore, Jasper said. He's in a hurry to get back before someone beats his time. Dish reddened and whirled on Jasper. She ain't a whore, he said. You take that back or I'll box your darn ears. Jasper was appalled at the challenge. His feet were cold and he knew he couldn't cut much of a figure in a fight with Dish. His hands were cold too. They were usually cold. And the thought of having to strike someone with a hard head with one of them was not pleasant. Well, I meant she was in her younger days, Jasper said. I don't know what she does for a living now. Dish stalked off in a cold, silent fury. He had resented many of the men throughout the whole trip because of their casual talk about Lori and saw no reason for elaborate goodbyes. 
Pocampo hung him with so many provisions that he could scarcely mount. Dish thought them unnecessary. I got a rifle, he reminded Poe. There's plenty of game. You may not want to hunt in the blizzards, Pocampo said. Before Dish left, Call told him to take an extra horse. Dish had mainly ridden Sugar all the way north and planned to ride him all the way back, but Call insisted that he take a little buckskin for insurance. Horse can go lame, he said. All the men were standing around, disturbed that Dish was leaving. Newt felt like crying. Leavings and dyings felt a lot alike. Dish, too, at the last moment, felt a powerful ache inside of him at the thought of leaving the bunch. Though most of the hands were disgraceful, rude, and incompetent, they were still his companeros. He liked young Newt and enjoyed teasing Jasper. He even had a sneaking fondness for Lippy, who had appointed himself Cook's helper and seldom got far from the big fireplace. But Dish had gone too far to stop. He had no fear at all of the dangers. He had to go see Lorena, and that was that. He mounted and took the lead rope with a little buckskin. P.I., who had been off near the lots trying to loosen his bowels, the main effect on Montana had been to constipate him, missed the preparations for leave-taking. He had been in a sorrowful mood ever since the report had come back on Gus, and the sight of Dish, ready to ride off, upset him all over again. Well, I swear, Dish, he said. Tears welled in his eyes, and he could say no more. Several of the men were disturbed by the sight, fearing that they might behave no better. This shook hands quickly all around. So long, boys, he said. Look for me south of the Brazos if you ever get home. Then he touched Sugar with his spurs and was soon only a black speck on the snow. Call had debated giving him the letters Gus had written to the women, but thought better of it. If Dish was lost, and probably he would be, the letters would be lost too, and there were Gus's last words. Better to keep them and deliver them himself, though the thought didn't cheer him. Sitting in his tent that night, he pondered the change in himself. He had let the young man override his warning and leave. He could have ordered him to stay and put a little more of himself into the order, as he had oftentimes when men were unruly. Dish had been determined, but not determined enough to buck forceful command. As a captain, he had given such commands many times and never had one failed to be obeyed. But in this case, he lacked the interest. When it came time to summon the force, he hadn't. He admired Dish Boggett, who had indeed held a true point for 3,000 miles. He had also often proved himself the best man to break a stampede. But Call had let him go and didn't really care. He knew that he wouldn't care if they all went, except P and the boy. He had no impulse to lead the men another step. The next day, since the weather continued pretty, he decided to go to Fort Benton himself. Major Cord had indicated that the army might frequently need beef if the winter got bad and the tribes fared poorly. After all, he'd come to Montana in hope of selling cattle. Once the news reached Texas that they had made the drive, others would soon follow, probably by next fall, and it was well to establish good connections with the army, the only buyer in the territory who might want beef. It was during the captain's absence that Newt discovered a talent for breaking horses. Ben Rainey hadn't been an excellent rider. He had been assigned the task of breaking the Mustangs, but on the very first day of the work, a strong black horse threw him into a tree and broke his arm. Poe Campo set the bone, but Ben declared he had had enough of Buck and Bronx. He meant to apply for another job when the captain returned. Newt had been on wood detail, dragging dead timbers up from the creek, helping P.I. and Pete Spettle split them. He told Ben Rainey he'd have a try at the black, and he rode him into a standstill to the surprise of everyone, including himself. Of course, he knew that riding a horse through a bucking spell represented just a small part of a horse's education. They had to be gentle enough that it wouldn't be necessary to tie them down to the saddle them. They had to be taught to rein and, if possible, to take an interest in cattle. When the captain returned a week later with an order for 300 beeves to be delivered to Fort Benton by Christmas, Newt was in the little sapling corral they had built, working with a hammer-headed bay. He looked nervously at the captain, expected to be reprimanded for changing jobs, but Call merely sat on the hell bitch and watched. Newt tried to ignore the fact that he was there. He didn't want to get nervous and upset the bay. He had discovered that if he talked a lot and was soothing in what he said, it had a good effect on the horse he was working with. He murmured to the bay while the captain watched. Finally, Call dismounted and unsaddled. 
pleased him to see the quiet way the boy worked. He'd never been one for talk when there was work to be done. It was his big point of difference with Gus, who could do nothing without talking. He was glad the boy was inclined to his way. When they drove the beeves to Fort Benton, he took Newt and two other men with him. That winter, there were several such trips, not merely to Fort Benton, but to Fort Buford as well. Once when they arrived at Fort Benton, the army had just trailed in a bunch of raw, half-broken horses from the south. When they brought in the beeves, the fort was always full of Indians, and there was much bargaining over how the beeves would be divided between the major and the old Blackfoot chief the soldiers called Saul because of the sharpness of his features. Some blood Indians were there, too, on this occasion, and Call felt angry. He knew he was seeing some of the warriors who had killed Gus. When the Indians left, he felt like tracking them and revenging his friend, though he didn't know which braves had done it. He held back, but it made him uneasy to leave an attack unanswered. The Major found out that Newt was good at breaking horses and asked Call if he would mind leaving the boy at the fort for a few weeks to rough out the new string of horses. Call didn't want to, but the Major had dealt with him on fair terms and he didn't feel he could refuse the request, particularly since there was not much to do back at the ranch headquarters. They spent their time making improvements on the log house, starting a barn, and checking the cattle after their frequent storms. Most of the men spent their spare time hunting and had already brought in more buffalo and elk meat than could be eaten in the winter. So Call agreed Newt stayed at the fort a month breaking horses. The weather improved. It was cold, but the days were often fine and sunny. Newt's only scare came when he took a strong sorrel gelding out of the fort for his first ride, and the horse took the bit between his teeth and raced out into the Missouri ice. When the horse hit the ice, he slipped, and though he crashed through the ice, fortunately they were in shallow water, and Newt was able to struggle out and lead the horse out too. A few soldiers coming in with a load of wood helped him get dry. Newt knew it would have been a different story if the horse had made it to the center of the river before breaking through the ice. After that, when he took his raw mounts out for a ride, he turned them away from the river as soon as he left the fort. <music>